Tatum McCarg, broadcaster for ESPN, joins us. This is going to be his time on Thursdays around 4.30 with us on 365 Sports. Paul Catalina. Craig's out till next week. I'm David Smoke, and thank you for being here. And Taylor, you too. So, um, man, things are changing, buddy, since the last time we spoke with you. It's been a while, but Colorado will join the Big 12. Now it appears as if Arizona and Arizona State, unless they get cold feet, are about to possibly join the Big 12. Maybe even, who knows, Utah, what happens with then Oregon, Washington. Your thoughts about the musical chairs of realignment? It's just, uh, well, first of all, thank you guys. It's great to be back. Obviously, we're close to the season getting going. I'm ready to talk about football. I can't wait for the end of August to get here so we can start talking about games because this, to me, is my least favorite part of college football right now. I, the, the realignment game, uh, more often than not, this is really just benefiting the top echelon of schools, and there's a lot of schools that I feel like are getting left behind right now. Um, I saw a, a piece today. Uh, it was really coming from a fan's perspective on as a Washington State fan feeling like they were getting left behind in a, in a, a world where they belonged in a conference and knew where their place was in a one of the premier conferences for a very long time. And now it looks like who knows what their future looks like. And I think that's, that's the sad part in all this Mm -hmm. is the, the middle tier and bottom tier power five teams that have played really good football for a long time. I think about Oklahoma state. If you look about, if you look back in the last decade or 15 years at sustained success at the power five level, Oklahoma state's right there. I mean, that's a top 12 to 15 team in the last call it 15 years. And they're they're right now feeling like they're left behind when you know their peer group is in a lot of ways it's been Texas and Oklahoma they've been better than Texas the the realignment with the Pac-12 and this is goes without saying but it really just comes down to mismanagement of the TV contract and money that these schools the top level meaning USC UCLA the Arizona schools Washington Oregon they're they're rumored to the Big Ten. All of this is coming down to, you, you see the TV deal that's on the table right now with Apple TV, and they're looking around at what's being offered in the SEC and the Big Ten, and, and in some instances, even the Big 12, and saying, does it really make sense for us to stay here from a financial perspective? I hate that that's what it's being boiled down to, but this day and age of, of realignment, it, it really more than ever is coming down to dollars and cents in these TV deals. So, Taylor, just from a... You know, curious to you on the on the football perspective. How do you think this will will work out for uh, well, at least Colorado and, and probably looking now Arizona and Arizona State as well. If the if Arizona and Arizona State jump to the Big Twelve, all of a sudden the Big Twelve has really become a solid third place conference in college football. I, I think. If you look at teams that consistently year in, year out are competing for a national championship and have a realistic shot at a national championship, all of those schools are in the SEC and the Big Ten. There are some schools in in what will be the new Big 12 that will tell you that they are. And I know TCU had a shot at it last year, but realistically, year in and year out, they're all in the SEC and the Big Ten. Now, that being said, when this playoff expands, there's going to be opportunities for some of these schools in the new Big 12 to really get a chance to showcase themselves. And even if they don't get a bye week in that first round of the playoff games, if they're hosting a playoff game, think about a, an Oklahoma State or a TCU, a Texas Tech, a lot of hype around Joey McGuire in his second year there. Arizona, if they get things turned around, who knows what happens with Dion at Colorado. There's still a lot to be excited about if you're a Big 12 fan. And man, out of all of the realignment, I would say the biggest winners are the four teams that moved over to the Big 12 that can, that bumped up. So UCF, Houston, Cincinnati, BYU, they feel like, gosh, they've completely improved their station relative to what they were at in the, in the American Conference. And they, to me, that, that seems like the biggest winners in all of this. Um, but I think you've got to focus on if you're not in the SEC and you're not in the Big Ten, doing everything you can to try and get one of those playoff spots so that you get a shot at the TV money that's going to come from the expanded playoff. Taylor, we may have asked you this back when the story came down or you we've known about those four schools that are incoming, and we saw all of them at Big 12 Media Days, what, about uh, two or three, four weeks ago. Who of those four teams do you think is more prepared right now to perhaps even – 
make a mark the first year in the Big 12? I think it's probably BYU right now. Um, and that may not be this season, but they've had stretches of time where they've recruited at a really high level and have had quarterback play that uh, they, they recruited a high enough level that it, it would not surprise me if early on BYU competes in the Big 12. Houston, they lost a lot of pieces. I had them late in the year last year, and they it's not like they were starting to maybe quit on Dana a little bit. I think they're going to struggle this year. I think their their predicted win total for the season is is around four and a half or five, and I think that's probably right. Cincinnati, same thing. They've lost so many pieces, and especially since Luke Fickle's now moved on to Wisconsin, a lot to replace there. Central Florida, to me, is the one that's most interesting because their win total is hovering around the preseason win total. Vegas has them up close to a bowl team, right around 500. They're in such a talent-rich part of the country, but they're recruiting – against mostly ACC schools and SEC schools. Are you going to get enough kids that are going to play there knowing most of their games are going to be played in the South, farther from home? They're not playing really very close to home at all. But year in and year out, UCF has been pretty competitive. They've had a couple of down spots, but that's the one to me that I've got the biggest question mark on. But BYU right away, I would say in, in the first couple of years, I would expect them to compete. Taylor, what do you make of what's going on in the ACC right now? And Florida State barking and its long grant of rights, and I, I, I'm assuming they're just trying to get more people to come with them so they can legitimately challenge it, uh, not by themselves, but with a group of people. But it it's, might be necessary for their, their business future, but it just doesn't seem like a great look to me right now. I think it's the same thing in some ways that they're dealing with the Pac-12, the grant of rights going out as far as it does in the future. I think it's really ham- it's been a, an issue and it hamstrings the ACC in being able to be mobile. And uh, with these TV contracts as quickly as they've come about, that's been a major problem for the ACC. Uh, Florida State and Clemson clearly are the two groups. When I, I said earlier, you know, which conferences have – uh, teams that can compete for a national championship. Those would be the two outliers. And then maybe you could throw in Notre Dame as well, but Florida state and especially Clemson clearly can compete at that level would make sense. Look, if you're going to go, if the SEC is going to go get Texas and Oklahoma, it's not a far reach to, to assume that Clemson and Florida state, they're surrounded by SEC schools as well. But I agree with, I think where you were going with that point that, that conference has been the ACC, I mean, really the, the nuts and bolts of it for so long. Does it really make sense to blow that up? Or is it better to lean into what you have and be that, call it, you know, if the Big 12 is, is the third tier, they're right next to the, that new Big 12, maybe even slightly better since you do have two teams that will compete for, could compete for a national championship. I hope they don't leave with all of the conference realignment. In almost every instance, I hope that teams don't move. I think it's better off when – uh, your your core team stay in place, but that's just not the world we live in right now. Taylor, you played the quarterback position, right? I did. So yesterday, a couple of days ago, there was a, a like a little get together, Baylor football coaches, and also the media. It was more just to kind of maybe ask some questions off to the side. But one of the things I walked up to Jeff Grimes and just asked him about why is Blake Shapin going to be better this year? So one of the things, without giving away a lot, but one of the things he talked about is just. There is some sort of a trend about sophomore quarterbacks who had a pretty good time or had some success, some success as a freshman. Usually they take a step backwards and then they improve. I don't know if that's completely like evidence everywhere, but that made sense to me. Your thoughts about that? I saw my, I was a four year starter at Rice and I saw my biggest jump between my sophomore and junior year. Okay. Uh, there were some, there were a couple of reasons for that. I was hurt a lot my freshman year. Uh, sophomore year, we played a really challenging schedule, but I did end up getting benched for the last three games of my sophomore season. And there was some growing up to do, there was some maturing for me and the off season that was probably my best off season and just in terms of growth and going, going into my, my, junior year that felt like the year that I had taken the biggest step and um, it showed we went from first two years that I was a starter we were both four and eight and then we jumped to seven and six my junior year went to a bowl game won the bowl game and then won conference USA in my senior year and 
it progressed year over year. Some guys don't need that. Some guys are more mature than, you know, my, the version of me at 20, 21, not a super mature guy. Um, it just depends on the, the person. But I do think on field, you would expect that, you know, as a sophomore, you should be better than as a freshman. But if for most guys, take out the Trevor Lawrences of the world, there's usually not this giant leap between year one and year two. It really starts to happen junior year, senior year. When you get guys that have played three, three and a half years, that is a lifetime in college football. I mean, that is a ton of experience that honestly I think it's overlooked. I'm going on a little bit of a rant here, but when we talk about Arch Manning at Texas and this expectation that he was going to come in and just set the world on fire, you're, you're comparing him to a guy in Quinn Ewers that has been around the block a couple different times, two different schools, injured last year, but has played at a high level already, even though it's a short period of time. To expect an 18-year-old to jump in and compete against that, it's just not the norm. There are outliers that it happens, but that, that is not the norm. And especially for college kids, that experience and the buildup from years two, three, and especially four, it, it is so impactful to those kids. Taylor, uh, when you look around uh, the Big 12 and the, and the quarterbacks this year, the biggest question now has to come out of Iowa State. Now that Hunter Deckers has to step away for this gambling issue, a, a thing that it's going to hit a lot of teams eventually, uh, you know, as more and more information starts to drop uh, on those things. But they have to go with probably true freshman J.J. Cole. You said you were a four-year starter. What lies ahead for him in his first year as a starter? Yeah, any true freshman. Well, first off, I think the uh, the gambling issues across college football, I think kids, this goes without saying, but this will be a lesson that hopefully a lot of other kids learn from. And if they thought about having an account like this, I mean, it, it go, it, you're seeing it in the NFL as well. It is something that um, it's so forward-facing now in sports where even just 10 years ago when I was playing, it wasn't, right? It was very taboo. Now you turn on college game day and you've got the top picks and you've mm -hmm. got the lines on the on the ticker and it feels I can I can understand how as a, a college kid it's so in your face and you're a part of it that there's the temptation to do that. But hopefully, a lot of kids learn the lesson uh, on behalf of what's happening at Iowa and Iowa State right now. Specific to the, the true freshman that's going to have to step in. Look for any true freshman that gets put in at major at a major college football program all about keeping it simple. And for Iowa State, I think that's exactly what you're going to see this year. You're going to get a lot of quick game. You're going to get a lot of specific shot plays. They will not have the offense opened up nearly what it was like last year. And that's usually the case across the board. Anytime a, a senior quarterback or a veteran quarterback goes down and you have a freshman come in, expect to see a pretty simple version of the offense and expect to see a lot of mistakes. I think Iowa State, that drops them down probably by a win and a half, maybe two full wins. Uh, it could be even worse than that. To be honest with you, I haven't gotten eyes on who the true freshman that they have coming in, um, but it, it certainly is going to be impactful to them. Thank you, Taylor. It's great to have you back. Where did you go this summer that you can tell us? Uh, I mean, like you, <laughs> did, you, did you go overseas? Did you just kind of chill? Did anything in particular that was maybe your favorite time other than being around family? Man, we we went to visit some friends in London, and wow. uh, we were the – we, we were the genius parents that brought our 14 month old with us. Um, so apologies to everybody that was on our flight over. Uh, it was not a great experience for them, but we had a great summer, a lot of fun traveling around, um, enjoyed the trip to London. And now, man, I, I'm not just saying it. I'm fired up to be back with you guys and got the first couple games of the schedule coming in and fired up to, uh, to get going and get this season underway. Will you, will you be doing a couple games a week sometimes now? I will. I've got a little bit of a different deal this year. I've got a, a small package of games with CBS as well. And so, oh. you know, like week week one, I've got Tulsa on Thursday night, and then I go to Liberty for a Saturday game with CBS. And so I've got a couple weeks like that. I've got a Conference USA is the deal with CBS. And they, if people don't know this, this will be great for college football fans this year. We all know about Maction where they play that November schedule on weeknights. Well, Conference USA is doing the same thing in October. So I've got a Tuesday night game uh, with Louisiana Tech and Middle Tennessee. And uh, so I'm, I'm kind of spread around this year, but uh, really uh, fired up for both of those packages of games. And, um, man, it, it's almost here. So, okay, CBS. So what networks will you be seeing? ESPN right. and CBS. Okay. Uh, most of, I would say, 
the CBS stuff will be obviously on CBS or CBS Sports Network, right. and then uh, ESPN still a lot of streaming, um, and then you know some games that get flexed up to ESPN U or sometimes ESPN two, but. A lot of those we won't know until we get closer. All right, congratulations on that, my man. Uh, great to have you on. Look forward to it. Thursdays around 4.30. Taylor McCarg, college football analyst, also now with ESPN and CBS, former Rice quarterback. All right, uh, we 